we've heard of deals in the 60 plus range um plus that, thousand that, um, not 60 dollars <laughs> there are some schools are like yeah that's our Here's welcome to our bucks. state laws. Here's your 60 bucks and a Dave and Buster's gift certificate. Do you want to come to our school? And then other schools are like, have a chariot. Remember, the show is PG 13, so you might hear a naughty word or two. Norbert's is having a sale on cable tighteners, you guys. Go to norbert's.net for a 10% discount on anything with the code Gymcastic November. Norbert's are also giving away a $50 Norbert's gift card that can be used on anything in their online store. No minimum. Just follow Norbert's Athletic on Instagram, then like and comment on the giveaway post. Good luck. Gabby Douglas posted a suitcase with the caption, Camp Bound. FIG has decided to allow Russian and Belarusian gymnasts to compete in 2024 under very specific conditions. Utah head coach Tom Farden has been placed on administrative leave due to actions unrelated to athlete welfare, according to University of Utah. NCAA signing day! In other words, we're going to tell you where you can find your favorite Paris Olympians after the Olympics and follow your favorite elites where they will compete for four months every weekend straight. It's the best time of the year. The Swiss Cup report we will talk about. And we have the U.S. selection, USAG, selection criteria minutes uh, from Worlds. And we're going to discuss because Spencer and I have you guys. <laughs> feelings about <laughs> highest scoring teams. This is November 13th, 2023. And welcome to Gymcastic, the number one gymnastics podcast in the galaxy. I'm Jessica. I'm here with Spencer from the Balance Beam Situation. Let's get to the headlines right away. Gabby Douglas going to camp. Mm -hmm. Posted okay. a, suit, a suitcase. So it can only mean one thing. Hashtag camp, camp bound, bound. With a suitcase. There's no other camp. As there we are. learned. That's true. That's from true. watching Gabby Douglas's uh, Douglas Family Gold, that they are not really campers, even when they pretend to. It, camping outdoor in a tent is not their thing. It's definitely national team camp, is what we think. Um, also, she posted a uh, video of herself doing a standing full on Beam, which is the. I mean, has any time passed? Could you tell mm. if it was? <laughs> 2012 or 2023 with the standing full be honest yeah, she's there. ready she's ready i mean my honest answer is yes but also she's ready yeah that's how i feel it's beautiful it's fantastic she takes like the tiniest step like her chest is down a little but it's like that's fine use it there's no reason not to do the standing full she's yeah. gabby douglas okay she also did an interview with uh time this week where she said her family encouraged her to return this time around, and she stopped competing after 2016 because of the bullying uh, that she received and also all the criticism and controversy around team selection. So when we find out anything from camp, we will report mm. back to you, hopefully, mm. uh, on behind they're the they're there right now as we Yeah, record. camp's happening. Like early, we were recording on the 13th of November. Camp's in progress yeah. right now. <laughs> Are you surprised? Because we've talked about like, oh, I mean, our kind of maybe unrealistic dream scenario that Gabby would just be like, I don't want to go to camp because I don't need to. And I'm just going to show up to compete. So maybe that's not happening. But, you know, I understand within the like within the system, they definitely want you to go to camp. Yeah, they want you to go to like, it's very much encouraged that you go to camp. So, you know, make the they, Olympic team play by the rules. <laughs> they re I mean, this is one of the things that uh, Dan Baker told me, who's one of the Trident uh, the three people that run with the program um, was like, you know, we don't want a scenario where someone can just show up and make a team. Like they have to heaven forbid. I was like, why <laughs> isn't it about who's the best? Why should you have to put up with camp as a grown ass adult? Uh, yeah. The FIG says Russian and Belarusian athletes can return to competition under very specific rules. And the first rule is athletes from Russia can't talk about being from Russia. We're going to talk about the criteria. Like, even if they gave an interview and were like back home in Minsk, out, disqualified, leave the competition. Like, that's. Yes. So basically, the idea is we learned earlier in the year that the FIG was going to allow Russian and Belarusian athletes to compete in 2024 at that point they said you know by as long as they adhere to the ad hoc rules and then everyone was like okay what are the ad hoc rules and the fig was like nope 
But now we have the ad hoc rules, which is the development um, that took place this week. And they are, you know, if you follow them, pretty stringent in terms of who would be allowed to compete. So the first part is you can only... Uh, you you have to return as an individual only. You can't compete as a team. Like you can't try to put three individuals up and get a team score. They will not give you a team score. You cannot uh, represent your country, federation, organization, including the National Olympic Committee, which is how mm-hmm. Russia was allowed to compete under their drug drug doping ban. They were like, you can compete, but under the Olympic Committee of the Russian Federation. Uh, mm-hmm. So no more of that nonsense. Um, so let's talk specifically about the criteria. So it's retroactive from the beginning of the war. Yes. Um, the first, basically the overall sentiment is you can compete as a, you know, unaffiliated individual neutral athlete as long as you haven't, have not, quote, acted against the peace mission of the Olympic movement by actively supporting the war in Ukraine. You know, that peace mission of the Olympic movement, Jessica, that they take very seriously. Take very seriously, which is why no one in the military from any country is allowed to compete. Yeah. Um, So item one is you cannot be linked with the military or national security in any way. Pretty straightforward, but gets interesting or potentially questionable when it comes to how many of the Russian athletes compete at military sp- or train at military sponsored clubs for instance like angelina melnikova trains at cska which is affiliated with the military so then the question is like my reading of it is like okay that's affiliated with the military you're linked with the military we don't know if it will be read that way by others but that's you know one of the things a well, possibility in terms of how athletes might be allowed to compete uh, under these rules part two is no communication associated with Russia or Belarus, including social media or interviews. Very broad. Very broad. Very broad. And, and that means, that extends to, if you come to a competition, like I was talking about, you say the word Russia, you're out. And they That's even mentioned, this. like, this includes retweets. Like that's right. one of the examples they give. Like, and you messages. Yeah. That's the thing. Like, I feel like if you DM someone or they're going to ask for your phones, I mean, that's what's very interesting. And we'll get into how they're going to do this in a minute. And part three is you can't have shown support for the war, um, include being, being contracted uh, military or security agencies, but also explicit or implicit actions, including pro-war events or demonstrations or use of the symbol Z. The events and demonstrations part is going to be critical for a lot of the women's gymnasts in particular who haven't been necessarily super involved or outspoken, like Nagorny, who's, you know, actively head of the youth army. And it's, you know, but a lot of the women's gymnasts have appeared at rallies, like per Gymnovosti, Orozova and Listunova, have been officially sanctioned by Ukraine for appearing at a pro-war rally with the Z symbol on their chest. So by these rules, that would also be disqualifying for them. Yep. And even, I mean, the the thing that Putin has done is he's co-opted the Victory Day marches and parades, which were about defeating the Nazis, and Mm -hmm. made these into, and were about veterans and, you know, celebrating people who defeated the Nazis, and he's made them into these pro, I mean, if you guys aren't aware, like, Putin is basically saying that uh, Ukraine are the equivalent of Nazi Germany and that they're doing the same things. And so they've all been co-opted. So all of those things count now. Mm -hmm. And so what I think potentially, if we even get through the to the part of the process where athletes are applying to be individual neutral athletes, which we may not even get there how they're going to go about determining this. That's the big question for me is like, how are you applying these rules? Who is applying them? Are you just writing these and then going to ignore them? Because that happens in gymnastics sometimes. So right. what's, what's the deal? So obviously they should just hire Luba from Jim Novosti and have her testify on who's allowed to compete and who isn't. That's number one. Um, 
the and if you guys don't know we always link to her website every in every single show note um at our resources at the bottom and citations because she has been closely following what's happening how it's impacting the ukrainian athletes um and also which athletes from russia or belarus are supporting um the russian invasion so um they so the fig is hiring a international agency to do an investigation um if necessary like this isn't just you apply and they're like okay they aren't going to investigate you and see if you meet the criteria um and additional to that and for you have most of them by the way the investigation should just be a google search and then you're done and you didn't google images burnt and you're out um also you have to take a drug test before you compete but the from between the time you apply and competition which i think is also very important consider that they were um banned based on doping so my question for you spencer the previous the previous previous edition the pre how many the last two olympics or last olympics i can't keep up there's been some winter in there yeah um so who's going to be eligible and will anyone try to even be eligible for this yeah that's my That's the main thing for me, because as I said, like if you, my reading of this is like, basically no one is eligible because you have, you know, the men's Tokyo team that, um, it's reported that they donated a drone to the Russian military. So that's out, you're out. And all of the, you know, women's athletes, we just mentioned with various possible associations, rallies and all of that. I think it's like, you know. No one. So that's why I wonder if Russia will simply say, like, we're not doing this. Like, rather than go through the process of athletes trying to apply, they may say, you know, no, we're not participating in this and just not even enter the process. And just in kind of a, like, you can't fire me, I quit kind of way. Just like, oh, well, we're not, we're not attempting to participate we may also see like depending on how things go with the olympics we may also see russia just say like this is an indignity that we are being forced to do we're not going to send any athletes as a country yep. um so there is already a part of the fig website uh where you can look at you know they have the database for who has been authorized as neutral athletes which they just launched this so it says you know the search at the end says returned zero person which i thought was telling also even though they just started it because i read these rules and i'm like yeah return zero person yeah no one's gonna that that returns zero person to me but we will see how they are ultimately applied i think what would be really interesting is if um ira alexeva were still competing elite and she's a gymnast at stanford Uh now trained at woga was not eligible to have U.S. citizenship to compete for the U.S., was eligible for Russia, went to one world championship and competed for Russia. She's someone who, like, if she were still competing elite, would probably get through this and be mm-hmm. authorized to compete as a neutral individual. But you know, she's at Stanford now being like, look at my beam mount, deal with that. Uh, I love about these rules that they have to wear, they have to basically use a light blue sheet for a flag. Like, mm-hmm. they're, t- and... Their uniform, so their Leos have to be the same. Light blue warm-ups and Leos, no symbols, nothing. I What I love about this is it's so, you can't use, it's light blue. You can't use the Russian colors at all. And I know they have like all new colors they're using for the war. But what I think of, about this is it's kind of, I mean, the FIG should just come out and be like, no, we're not allowing this. But on the other hand, This is kind of a smart way for the FIG to be like, okay, IOC, we'll do what you want, but no one's, we're going to make a criteria that no one can meet. So we're setting the bar so high that no one's going to be able to compete. So effectively, we're following your rules, but we're not letting anyone in. Yeah. I mean, that's what I think is what's going to happen. Right. But we shall see. Yeah. These rules also apply to judges where they can't talk about where they're from and they Mm. can't wear their symbols, nothing. So, I mean, it extends pretty far. So, uh, oh, we didn't talk about what Valentina said, which is um, 
But previously, Valentina, who's the head of the women's gymnastics program in Russia, said basically no one's going to apply for this. Yeah, there have been various, you know, interviews and quotes over the months that have kind of indicated leaning in that direction. Yeah, but nothing since the criteria actually came out. Mm -hmm. Club Gym Nerd, you get discounts and first dibs on live show tickets, an extra whole podcast every week, athlete dossiers for major competitions, code guides, options to commission your own segments. It also makes a great gift. Check it out at gymcastic.com at the Join the Club tab. All right, let's talk about what's happening at Utah with Tom Farden placed yeah. on administrative leave. Yes, this was very surprising, at least yeah. to me, because we just did behind the scenes. And I was like, if they were going to do something, they already would have done something, was my sentiment. I was like, the, Utah's done. Now we learn today that, or actually last night, that um, Utah has placed Tom Farden on administrative leave. Um, and their press information said recent conduct and actions by coach. It's due to recent conduct and actions by coach Farden, not related to student athlete welfare, which simply do not align with our values and expectations. So we all went, okay, well, what the what? Right. And according to the desert news report by Trent Wood and desert news are the ones that first reported on this. Um, I, the, this seems to be confirmation that this is unrelated to publication of the investigation on Farden earlier this year that was about verbal and emotional abuse by an outside mm -hmm. law firm. And it came back and said that they found that Farden hadn't violated safe sport rules or, quote, severe, uh, pervasive, or egregious acts of emotional abuse or verbal abuse. They did say in that report, if we could corroborate some of these stories with anyone else besides a single person, then these m the things that are, he's accused of he may have reached the level of, you know, violating our policies on um, verbal abuse, basically, of athletes, but we couldn't, no one would corroborate these stories. Um, and this comes a week after Olympic alternate Kara Aker left the school amid the allegations that, you know, she's like, I, I went to the administration, I told mm -hmm. them what Tom Farden was doing, and you guys didn't put this stuff in the report. Um, and then the assistant coach at Utah, Carly mm -hmm. Dockendorfer is taking over as the head interim head coach in that's yeah. her new title. Mm -hmm. And she has been there as an assistant coach for yep. several years. Coaches beam. Um, what was interesting to me, Jessica was the classic Sunday night timing of this news. And I use classic sarcastically because that's like what I'm reading into it. Cause I don't know exactly what happened here but like obviously we can't resist reading into it i'm like that's you weren't planning to do this if you released this on sunday night that's not something you were like expecting for several weeks and just getting ready to announce kind of thing yeah uh yeah um if you were taking bets, what do you say this is about? Because I have many. That is a trap of a question that I'm not going to fall into. Pass. Here are many options that we oh, can okay. start with. Okay. Uh, NCAA or NIL violations. Okay. That's one thing. Um, retaliation. Okay. That's We've seen that happen before. There have been coaches dismissed for retaliating against athletes who um, reported abuse, allegations of abuse. There... The, a lot of universities or employers have basically a clause in the employment contract that says something to the effect of you bring bad press to the program. It doesn't have to say it's your fault, just you're making us look bad. It's PR. These are all speculation. These are just options we're throwing out there. I'm just saying these Jessica's are some of the, throwing out there. Some uh, of the I things would say that, that last one, wouldn't that have already been taken into account when they first said, like, Tom's staying on? It gives another um, opportunity to be like, oh, this isn't going away. So let's find another option to... Hmm suspend him and you know he's not dismissed as as of this recording he still has a job he's on paid leave mm -hmm. so uh yeah so that's what's happening in utah yeah was it did it surprise you that they that this is they stipulated this was not 
this was recent behavior, not related. Well, they to didn't athlete necessarily welfare. say it was recent behavior. They did say it was recent behavior, not related. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. To sorry, athlete yes, welfare. Yes, they did recent conduct and actions. Right. Yeah. So they went out of their way to be like, "We're still okay with everything you did before." Right. Yeah. Uh, okay. Now the fun NCAA news. Ah. Uh huh. Which is it's National Letter of Intent Week. Mm-hmm. Which means everybody signed, most people, for they told us officially, not verbally, which means nothing, officially right. on paper, signed away their rights to the <laughs> NCAA. To a school. To yeah, a, to in a perpetuity. Yeah. Um, so the big news. Yeah, so this was the signing period for the 2025 competition season. So just for clarification purposes, this is not for January. These are not people who are going to be competing in January. This is for the following season. They're signing now. So we, well, I wouldn't say we expected Charlize Jones to sign as part of this class at this point because she's been verbally committed to Florida for like her entire life, like just solid decades at this point and has not signed. So it's been years and years. She did not sign for Florida during this period, which was we thought maybe she might have because these are the people who are if you're aiming to compete at the uh, Paris Olympics in 2024 or try for the Paris Olympics in 2024, then and then go to college right after that, you'd start college in the fall of 2024. You'd compete in 2025. That's these people. That's this class. So we thought, okay, so if she was planning Paris and then maybe Florida, this is when she would sign. She didn't sign. So, you know, we'll see. And she may be saying the same thing. She may be like, yeah, we'll see. I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. We'll see. There is precedent for athletes to, like, because Shailise is going to turn 22 around the Olympics. That is precedent for athletes to still compete in college around that age. Like, Sabrina Vega was 22 when she started at Georgia. So, yeah, which is it's something... not necessarily, like, the clock. The clock is ticking in that regard. Right. And the clock is different depending on what division you're in. And the divisions just have to do with how many scholarships, mm. full scholarships you're allowed to offer. So division one, normally it starts from 18 if you continue competing. So that's why we were so surprised with Vega. But Vega didn't compete for many years. So that might be the reason. So we'll see what happens. Okay. Mm. Next big elite signing from the 2022-23 world, U.S. world team. Good. You got it at the, on the Gold second medal. try. <laughs> Team gold medalist. Oh, that was a that was you were yeah, prompting me to say. I was, to say. You I was ready for you to say it, and then there was a pause. Joss Robertson signed uh, for Arkansas, which he had verbally committed to before. So she's the first world's teamer to go to Arkansas, which is a big deal for that team. Um, we're very excited to see her in college gymnastics. My question for you, Jessica, is: Do you think she's going to do both? I think think that's a continue elite do college at the same time type. I think she will, especially because she is a very durable athlete. Like, I think this, you know, ankle sprain is like one of her first injuries. So I think that she is someone who can sustain an elite and NCA schedule um, all at once. So I expect her to try both. Yeah, I mean, we have a lot of people doing that at this point, and of course, name, image, and likeness has made it more, much more convenient, um, or at least maybe not convenient, but appealing to try to do both at the same yeah. time for a lot of people. So I can I certainly do, see it. I do want to caveat that the you know clock on eligibility used to start at 18, so it may have changed now with NIL. So don't quote me on that. The eligibility rules with NCA are such. It's a state of flux because, like, yes. nothing actually makes sense at this point, and it feels very amorphous. I mean, it's never made sense. I guess it makes right. the most sense now than it's ever made, but it still makes no sense. And there's so many times people have just applied and been like, well, this is a special case. And the NCA is like, okay. So, I, you know, it's all. Yeah. We need to talk about LSU because LSU was just like all the gymnasts, please. <laughs> and all the gymnasts were like, yeah. <laughs> we're ready. Yeah, because Kalia Lincoln signs with LSU, Zoe Miller signs with LSU, Lexi Zeiss, and Kaylin Cho, who is the Ugh. one of the group who's not doing elite anymore. 
but she was, if you remember her, um, from Jim Katz in That's Vegas. Mm -hmm. And she was getting 14, above a 14 on beam, which is a big, fat, elite score before mm -hmm. she decided to go back to level 10. Um, which, I mean, and, you know, Jim Katz is a performance and show-based uh, gym that also has, gym, you know, competitive gymnastics that's really good. And they have, you know, Olympians. Um, but I just, if you want to know who's great in college gymnastics, the Jim Cats. If they come from Jim Cats, they're <laughs> really good. They have some style, some flair. They know what they're doing over there. Um, yeah, but this is a stack. And they have Zoe Miller. Oh, yeah. She's going to be, she's going to replace. I think Zoe Miller is going to replace the... Um, who is it? The uneven had... bars with just gold. <laughs> <laughs> just because really, we don't need uneven bars anymore. We're just going to have piles of gold. You're welcome. Who does Ukrainian bars at Oklahoma? Who should be getting a 10 and never does because her routine is so Audrey freaking Davis. hard? Audrey Davis. She is going to be the new Audrey Davis of college gymnastics. Mm. That is my prediction. Um, and Kalia Lincoln, of course, who should have been on the world team. We'll discuss that in a minute, but went to um, Pan Am's instead and won things. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So uh, what's interesting is that yeah. Connor McLean could have yeah, a one year overlap. Oh, no. Multiple years. With Brian. Connor's, Connor's with the, um, there. She hasn't, you know, had a competition year yet, but there's a possibility that, you know, if Haley Bryant takes a fifth year, she, that would if be in they take a fifth year, yeah. If Haley Bryant takes a fifth year, that would right. be in the 2025 competition season. That would be uh, 2025 would be Aaliyah Finnegan's senior year. Um, so they would, you know, potentially be there at the same time as Lincoln and Miller and Zeiss and Cho and Connor McLean and Bryant and Finnegan. Like, okay, but kind of a lineup. Right. Um, th this is the thing. If LSU doesn't win with this stacked lineup of a million elites, like the one thing with getting a million elites is they can all be like completely destroyed and all need surgery. Yeah, the first it doesn't entire mean, year. Doesn't, it mean doesn't mean anything mean. in and of itself. Right. But it, there are so many elites with beautiful gymnastics that are going to LSU. And you might ask, how is LSU doing this? Uh, adding like, you know, 20 people to their roster. I don't know how many people are on the roster right now, <laughs> but it's way more than the 12 full scholarships you're allowed to add. Um, and it's interesting that. Um, there is a report by Fansided that said that the LSU football recruits in 2022 were averaging about $100,000, over $100,000 in NIL money. And that's just the recruits. That's not the top players. The top players are making multiple millions. Um, so we've heard of deals in the 60 plus range. Um, 60 plus that, thousand. The 60 plus thousand dollars. <laughs> not um, 60 dollars. There are some schools who are like, yeah, that's our Here's welcome to our bucks. state laws. Here's your 60 bucks and a Dave and Buster's gift certificate. Do you want to come to our school? And then other schools are like, have a chariot. Uh, so, and that's in addition to their scholarship. Like, come here in addition. Here's your down or come here. We don't have one of our 12 scholarships for you. So come here still because of this stuff. Because you'll make this money. Yeah. So, I mean, with the collectives and how they work and states being different, I mean, there's some states that cannot offer the kind of things that LSU are doing. So um, in the past, the team with the most top elites has won. But Oklahoma was like, that's lame. We only need one top elite at a time and we'll win everything. Ninja level 10, suck it. Uh, but we'll see if that still holds up after this. Mm. Almost like it's a, a sport that you have to watch to see what happens because you it's don't very know. Very exciting. Something. So we also uh, have Andina Champong, British elite world medalist signing for Cal, which is very exciting. So she was on the 2022 world team silver medal winning squad very interested to see her college composition routines and how because like with cal especially on bars and beam they're like you know i was saying they're they're cal is blue state oklahoma like that's when you watch their gymnastics that's kind of what you see and i want to see how andina champong adapts into that style and i'm very excited for that I'm very excited because she is funny. She can dance. Uh, she does a great interview. Like 
this combination with the choreography and style of Cal, ah, I'm so excited. And also she's going to get to graduate with a degree from Berkeley. I mean, like that's academic schmackademics. Yeah. That's I think so we've nice established. <laughs> Boo. Don't care. Um, so Utah also retained all of its verbal commitments. This happening, signing day happening before news of Tom Farden being placed on administrative leave. But, you know, nice. it happened Curious. a few days beforehand. But uh, so signings like Clara Raposo, who was one of our favorite Canadian junior elites for a number of years. Excuse uh, me. It's Clara Raposo of Canada and her bangs have committed to Utah. I'm mm. obsessed with her hair. Do you yes, guys? Let's it's continue reducing women to their appearances on this podcast. She has style. <laughs> Come on, Spencer. This is like if we didn't talk about uh, what, like, so what's her name's weightlifting and Mustang as a personality um, at uh, LSU, the one that I love at LSU. KJ Johnson. KJ Johnson. She literally, I mean, she talks about her car as like this. Who? What other gymnast have we had that talks about their car? I don't only know. Blaine Wilson, who was like, <laughs> what's a fun fact about you, Blaine? And he was like, I drive a boobity boob car. I mean, this is what yeah. we're waiting for. Okay. <laughs> but I thought you were going to use this opportunity to talk about, you were talking about NIL a lot, that non-US oh, yeah. students can't, can't do that. Yes. Uh, Non-NIL, this is the problem. The Canadians can't get all this money. It sucks. What are we going to do about the Canadians? I know we this is do the something thing. for them. There should be a trust that someone just stashes away like they do in all the footballs. And then someday some, I'm not saying you should break the rules. I'm just saying the rules are stupid, but basically you have a student visa, so you can't work. So they should be given a work and student visa. This applies to on Dean too. This applies to all of the international students that are currently here right now. Um, you know, and it's not like she can rely on her, Canadian national team stipend. Piddly. If you can get it. Also, Stanford want to talk about, because we have Levi jung Rui Vivar going to oh. Stanford, which is very exciting for college gymnastics. Oh my god. Levi, first of all, she's going to get a degree from Stanford. So, yeah. that's we the don't, first We've win. established that, like, <laughs> books schmucks, we're not, we don't care about your academics on this show. <laughs> Um, Levi, amazing, beautiful day. You know how I describe Levi? If a ballerina did bars, this is what it would look like. This is the highest compliment I can give. Mm -hmm. There is nothing else above that. That Unicorn compliment is do it. as high as Levi's toes, because she huh. is on her highest toe. <laughs> yes, as they proved with her NIL photo that she took when she, you know, released that she was going to Stanford, which was like a tango over the shoulder split on a mirror pose which was a promise of dance routines to come is basically what i think who's your most exciting international oh, american they, recruit yeah i'm very interested to see ui soma on this team because if you remember we talked about her because she was right in the mix for the japanese olympic team for the tokyo olympics and then got injured at nhk which is like the final of the selection competitions. Um, so she was right there, maybe would have been close. So very exciting to see her sign with Stanford. I am looking forward to that. I basically feel like Stanford under Tabitha Yim is like if Jessica picked a team, like it's your just like form and feelings. We'll see if anyone's healthy or ready to go, but like everyone just like, Jessica squeal anyone like did gymnastics and Jessica gave out a little squeal is like on the Stanford roster and then we'll see how it goes like but Sienna I Robinson do you remember Sienna Robinson mm. also from Vegas let me just yeah. tell you there is something about Vegas because it is an entertainment capital it is um a the gyms there tend to have a like, great dance training great circus and entertainment influences I would say and it's readily available. Like top people who've done this for a living training. And so, like Sienna Robinson, her dance is so spectacular. Oh my God. So I'm I'm just yeah, and she's starting this coming season. Yeah, she's there. Yeah. She's there. like Connor McLean is starting. She's already there at LSU. Sienna Robinson is there, freshman. Oh, I'm so excited. 
Yeah, that sound. That's the sound I was trying to describe. <laughs> of like the gymnasts that make that sound is Stanford's team. So yes. we'll see if the the scores and results come. But it's an exciting roster for the future years. Also, Canada South, aka Iowa, <laughs> where Larissa Libby was just like, you know what's cool? Canadians. Let's do all of that. Because like Cassie Lee and Arlie Tran from this year's world's team, mm -hmm. Sydney Turner, um, who was on the 2022 medal winning team, who I believe is expected to defer um, until after potentially the Olympics. We don't know because Lee, uh, Cassie Lee and Arlie Tran just signed. So we don't know about them deferring. We know it is possible to do both as Brittany Rogers and others showed us, but Brittany Rogers most recently and Shallon Olson, that you can, you know, do both college and make major canadian teams at the same time and that's doable um you know is it going to be workable it's like the present day canadian program going to make this workable because it's important that they keep all of their elites in the fold and wanting to try to do both so we will see but yeah larissa libby is like you know what yeah canada and hopefully don't make Get your maple leaf out canadian pride let's do it and don't make them like have to do a lot of extra things to get their national team stipend over to the United Nations of Missouri. <laughs> yes. I know there are, there are United Nations uh, team from this signing period. Cause we have Olivia Kelly who has competed level 10 in the U S has competed internationally for Barbados. The last couple world championships, Kaya Tonskinen who's been on the Finnish team at euros and worlds. Missouri's taken over, taken over the exciting flags department. Yes. And Trident. They're getting a Trident, which is, <laughs> you know, I love a Trident. Um, which is on the flag of Barbados, by the way. If yeah. you're not just like, know all, like, know, have all the world flags in front of you, like some of us might right now. I don't know. <laughs> which one of us uh, talked about how Minnesota is getting a new flag and we're very excited about it and how many states mm -hmm. should redesign their flags, but not Pennsylvania because it's perfect and has two horses on it. Um, <laughs> and it looks like a Dutch hex, which is a Pennsylvania Dutch, not actual Dutch people, but that Pennsylvania Dutch, which is fun. Okay. Auburn got uh, two big elites. Yeah. Caitlin Jong and Marissa Neal, who we both saw compete elite this year. It's kind of been under the radar, I think. You're, people aren't talking as much about Auburn's class as like LSU's with all the big names, yada, yada. But I think that is, you know, that's a, sol a solid haul yeah. for Auburn for the coming years. That's very interesting. And, and then now... UCLA was like, we would like some attention also. So after the signing period, our next year's verbal commitments will all just announce. So like Tiana Sumanasekera, Nola Matthews are coming out like <laughs> verbal commitment, verbal commitment. So those are not signings. Those are not for the 2025 season those wouldn't be presumably that we'll talk about them signing next fall but they were like oh also don't don't forget about us tiana and nola floratines and beamer teens at ucla with bj's choreography oh, i can't i'm already so excited i already have a whole plan for nola oh, no. to do oh, like no. an angry kitten who's about to attack a spider floratine and then becomes the spider. It's a whole, you guys, it's going to be amazing. Okay. So meanwhile, Oklahoma. Yeah. L Miller, who has been competing elite for a couple of years, has really nice um, beam scores in particular, uh, is like right on track. Like, yes, Twin City Twisters to Oklahoma. Amazing beam. Like, we got, we got it. We got it already. Check. We're done. Yeah, basically, Twin City Twisters are like, if you want great gymnasts on your team, you recruit from Twin City Twisters, which they are pretty evenly distributed to different teams now. There's one at UCLA, there's one going to LSU, there's, you know, Oklahoma has most of them, but... <laughs> <laughs> Oklahoma has Maggie Nichols' legacy. Yeah. They're like, do you want to be like Maggie Nichols? And everyone's like, yes. And then they're like, okay, here's the game plan. Now, I do want to mention one of the Georgia recruits. No, you know, big elite names, mm -hmm. but I think this is a big deal just for recruiting and legacy and collective and donor money reasons. Uh, they have um, Harlan, who goes by Harley, Harley Tomlin. She is the daughter of two-time Super Bowl champion coach Mike Tomlin. And Mike Tomlin, Pittsburgh. I don't know if you know him. He's one of my favorites. But anyway, Steelers. 
Fact yeah, checker heard, would like you to I have know. heard Jessica and Will Graves talk about Mike Tomlin more than I would ever care to do again. So, you know, that's that. You've hijacked the podcast to talk about football again, whatever. But I think this is a, a kind of a big deal because we've had other um, gymnasts who were daughters of athlete pro athletes who had a lot of money, um, but not head coach, two time cha- Super Bowl champion money. So I'm just saying this could there have be been big. some other pretty famous athletes. <laughs> yeah, but I'm I'm just saying. Um, but also, what does Georgia need? They already have a palace of a gym, a palace of a locker room if you can call it a a locker room that has it's basically a broadway better than broadway i would say nicer than broadway style locker room a get ready not hard it's not hard to get nicer i know broadway Broadway theater's backstage area i can that's the thing i can't even think of what is like these locker rooms that like that uh utah and georgia and alabama have like they are so fancy yes they're very fancy <laughs> so fancy what, does, what does georgia need is your question yeah to be able to say we're gonna win <laughs> to afford a they need to remember they need to learn how to win again and then people will be like oh what is maybe- suzanne yachlin's maybe most famous quote georgia gymnastics is a team of winners they need to get back to that so then they can t- say, like, hey, you're really good. Do you want to win things? Come to Georgia. Because they can't say that right now. No, they cannot. Uh, yeah, maybe that's what they can afford with uh, that Mike Tomlin donor money. We'll be right back after this. Meat news. The Swiss Cup. Mm, yes, your favorite money meat of the year. Spencer, we discussed this at length. On behind the scenes last we week did. on Friday, <laughs> but what is? Because I take for granted that people know these things about these. Yeah. Meats, what uh-huh. is the Swiss Cup? Is it a FIG World Cup? Uh, it is not. Um, Je- you guys, Jessica, if you didn't l- don't listen to behind the scenes, Jessica has been uh, ribbing me a little bit for ne- being never happier on the show than when someone asked about the strategy employed by gymnasts at the Swiss Cup. That it was like, and then after we recorded, I was like, wasn't that a fun episode? Wasn't that a really good one? Jessica was like, I mean, it was normal, but you're just a dork. That's why. I've never Um, seen Spencer light up (laughs) so much. So Swiss Cup is a meet where you can go make some money uh, at the end of the year with mixed teams representing different countries. Although Switzerland gets like a couple teams because it's in Switzerland. Um, And you basically select what event you want to compete at which point in the competition because teams get eliminated after every routine and then you see you know who has the lowest score so you pick you know i'm gonna do i'm really good at vault like because i'm jade carey and i'm gonna do vault as my first event so we can rack up a good score first three rounds you have to do three different events and then the final for the final two teams you can repeat an event so jade carey for instance her strategy was start with vault get a good vault score then do floor, get a good floor score. Then I guess I'll do bars because, like, I'm more likely to stay on the be- than beam, but like bars. And then it's the final, and we're in that. So I'm going to do vault. Yul Moldauer is going to do parallel bars. We're just going to get huge scores, and we're going to win. And that's what happened. So I love it. It's it's like nonsense as a meet, but I love it. I do like the strategy part of this. I don't like that you can just go to vault and get a higher score than everything else, mm. but. You know what I mean? If you I, have difficulty on vault, but you know, if yeah. you do, nothing else is matching that. I do also love that Kazumakaya, who's one of my favorites because mm-hmm. he is enthusiastic. All, is so enthusiastic. And also this is revenge for him being too per country, even though the, the athletes were invited, you know, way back in the summer. It's revenge for him being too for country um at world championships that he got mm-hmm. to compete here. And that he was the alternate the year before. Right. I mean, anybody that screams that much in a gymnastics meet, obviously put them on the team. <laughs> yeah, so they were silver medalists, uh, Kazuma Kaya and Hatakeda from Japan. Brazil got the bronze with Julia Suarez and Patrick Sampaio. And then they beat Italy in the bronze medal match, which I thought was kind of an upset. But um, Manila Esposito for Italy and Yuma Abedini. 
finished fourth. But this is a mixed team event. So you like the only downside I think of this competition is that sometimes you have to rely on boys for things, which like is a terrible idea. Because then you can be Melanie and have two amazing routines. But then if Jim, Jim Zoma misses on P bars, then you don't even get to advance to the semifinal. So that's the only problem here. I know, like on the one hand, I think this kind of format could save men's gymnastics in the United States. It's like you would get men's gymnastics to count for how the women do. People would watch it. They're competing at the same time. They'd have a bigger fan base than they get at their own meets. Like it's a strategy um, that could really help them. Um, So, but I don't think that'll ever happen. But I do like this idea of a mixed event. I also like that there's a lot of spotlights and drama and all that stuff. Spotlights and drama, just like our favorite fluff pieces and... Yeah. The retro movies. <laughs> so the other thing that happened in vaguely related to Meat News is that we got the selection committee minutes from USAG for the world's team selection. Which, first of all, I love that this is public. It should be public, but this is a relatively new thing. The transparency of this is the process that selection went through. So I do appreciate that we're getting that. The problem is this is also so infuriating to me as a document that it almost would be better for them if they just like did nothing or just were like, you don't know how we made this decision. Because basically they have a whole document which includes a chart of the highest scoring teams that shows, you know, Kalia Lincoln's on all four of the highest scoring teams and five of the six highest scoring teams, but then nowhere in the document do they address not picking her for the team. Like there's nowhere where they say this. So we saw that Kalia Lincoln was on the highest scoring teams, but we elected to do da, 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 because da, 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 da. Like there's no, that's just like, okay, here's a chart where Kalia Lincoln's on the highest scoring team. And then we took the all arounders obviously and then they do they go into why they selected kayla DiCello as alternate rather than kalia lincoln and it was because of like international experience <laughs> but um because that's nothing but <laughs> yeah they don't address like the the big factor the the biggest headline the news of this which is that kalia lincoln was on the top four highest scoring teams and they didn't pick her um, I, okay, so play devil's advocate for a second. Yeah. Let's say an athlete has an injury, a potential injury, something you're concerned about, and you can't make that public necessarily, um, but you don't, so you're not going to put it in there uh, and like publish it. But also I feel like the athletes are required to be honest about any physical ailments they have. And I don't see why you couldn't just be like, you know, probably can't do all around for a month, or I probably can't do the event that you need me to do, uh, you know, for the next two months. You have ways of talking about that. Right. You have so ways how... of saying physical readiness. That's oblique enough, but says what you need to say. You have, yeah. you know, you have a lot of ways you can talk about that. It seems like that wasn't part of the decision. Yeah. Because they're just like, oh, yeah, and then, you know, here were the highest scoring teams, and then we picked the all around. So I'm like, if you're going to do this, which is great to do, love that it exists, love that you're doing it, but you got to have reasons. <laughs> you got to say what you did, not just fake it, because it feels right. like this is faking it. Yep. And I think that one of the interesting things on here is that, you know, talking to people on the committee and asking them specific questions, um, there are lots of different opinions about why things are done and the reasons for it. Um, Totally opposing opposite sides of why people said, this is why we made it. No, this is why we say it. And that's why, I mean, you want those voices. You want people who have different opinions on the on the committee. I just wish we had a list of someone was like, this is stupid. I'm not doing it. Someone else said, yes, this is why we should do it. That's what I want. Yeah. I want like minutes. Like, yeah. and then the representative from da da said <laughs> this. But the thing is, do you think this is being published in so much depth because they are preparing to select the Olympic team in for Paris and they want to practice 
how to do this so the athletes like a Gabby Douglas doesn't get trashed and destroyed publicly by speculation about why she was chosen, even though it's obvious and we explained it a million times and even freaking Marta explained it. <laughs> um, no, I don't think that's the reason because it's not the first time they have published the minute, the selection minutes. I think this is like post Daniel's report. I want to say this is but something this is way more doing. detailed. Isn't this one more detailed to you? It has a little Even bit the chart of the score. I feel but like we've, I had just... the, we've had the scores, like various scoring options a couple times before, but so I don't think it's necessarily like specifically in preparation for the Olympics. I think we should use it as preparation for the Olympics decision where anytime anyone asks us who we think is going to be the Olympic team, we say the all around at trials. Cause that's right. everything they've told us is just like all around at trials, which it would have been, you know, we've learned this over the years. We learned that about Tom Forster too. But then like two seconds before he was like, Oh, we have a system that spits out the highest scoring teams. And we're like, Oh, so you're taking the highest scoring team. And he was like, no, we're like, what is happening here? But you know, we should, we should assume that the Olympic team will simply be the five top scoring all arounders from trials. Cause that's every in indication we've been given so far. Which is why I feel like we're never going to see Zoe Miller on a team, even though she would make a highest scoring team. Potentially. And we might, we might, I mean, even a Jade Carey, she might not make yeah. it with the, the highest scoring vault. So we'll, we'll see. But yeah, this is up. It's, uh, we'll put it in the show notes. You can always see these on the USAG, the um, mm -hmm. elite committee minutes, but uh, and every every time they have camp, they have they're usually a month later. Every two months or so, they have their meetings. So they're very interesting and informative. Okay, next up we have uh, a first. I want to get to the gym tournament news. Actually, sure, sure. Let's um, go. And I want to talk about something so exciting that we saw: Brooklyn Moore's oh. Canadian <laughs> legend, yeah, of beautiful gymnastics floor routine that made me cry every time she did it she posted she said um this is the only video she has of this skill it is a full in double front yeah let me repeat that so she goes up in the air does a tucked full and then does a front flip out of it two flips one twist i mean front, front. which is a big part of it <laughs> four words not yeah. like backwards this is like you're a level 10 you can do a full in like you're level nine you can do a full in this is she, preposterous this is I'm not gonna say she lands it but it's so cool <laughs> right and i mean some of the only people that we've seen doing a full twisting double front are um i mean zapata is known for doing these um some other gymnasts but it's just rare in general mm -hmm. um and this just shows why i mean i'm always like if you can do whatever you're doing, you should be able to do a harder version than what you're competing. Like in practice, you should be able to do a triple back, a you know quadruple twist if you're competing a, a triple twist, et cetera. And I'm just like, no wonder her front tumbling is still so easy because she's like, yeah, I used to twist this. Like meh, double front, <laughs> meh, so easy for me. Um, and she did compete at Podkopaiva, which was with mm -hmm. the half on the second flip many times. Oh, so anyway, oh, glorious skills. It's such a great week. We got this. We got Gabby's standing mm -hmm. full on beam. Hopefully get more videos from camp since Gabby came back. Um, okay. The other thing that is happening is we have a new movie called Girl Away From Home in the genre of Ukrainian gymnast movies, which are our favorite movies, and they have been so well done in the past. So it's the story of a 13-year-old Ukrainian uh, girl who flees to Germany with her grandmother after the Russian invasion. So if you want to know the impact of what's been of what Russia has been doing to Ukraine going back years back to the Maiden Revolution there's a story of a gymnast in a movie that will explain it to you. So this one is called a uh, girl away from home. And I'm excited to watch this. Um ESPN mm. taking gymnastics more seriously. Oh. And by more seriously I mean, paying for production costs for a meet, which normally they're like, you're having a meet. Okay, you pay for everything and we'll broadcast it. But now they are paying their production costs. 
So it's the ESPN's first totally owned and operated gymnastics invitational. So it's happening Saturday, January 13th. Uh, there's three sessions of meets. The main session is LSU, Oklahoma, UCLA, and host Utah. But it won't be. Is it at Utah? I think it's not at Utah. Well, it's at fake Utah. Yeah, it's at it's that a, place. It's that nearby where everything site. is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's the AB, that's which is on big ABC. That which session, is by the way, awesome. not even on ESPN. Yeah. And yeah, so I'm I'm very excited about this. Um, yeah. I'm interested to see how, how ESPN is going to is going to, you know, do when they they're actually they got Sprouts as a sponsor. So now it's the Sprout Squad. <laughs> I love, first of all, I love the actual food sprouts, the vegetable. Uh, it's not being sponsored by a specific veg, <laughs> the vegetable. I don't know about the store. I've never really been in there, but vegetables are great. Who can't get behind a, something named after a vegetable? So hooray. Okay, next up, we have a mini commission. If you don't want to bother with the whole joining club gym nerd thing, you can just give us money. Check out the No Strings Attached Donate button at the bottom of the Join the Club page at gymcastic.com slash club. This mini commission is from Club Nerd. Club Nerd. That's club what nerd. we should call it. That's what I am. <laughs> Not Club Gym Nerd. That's where I vacation. I vacation at Club Nerd. Club Nerd. The hottest gymnastic trivia games and Dungeons and Dragons every night. Meet your fellow nerds. Did you ever play Dungeons and Dragons? No. Be honest. No. No, because you don't like fantasy stuff, do you? No, I do. I don't like cooperative things. <laughs> I don't think that was that funny, but sure. <laughs> it's so you, Spencer. It's like a group project, but it's supposed yeah, to be it's a, like a game. Social occasion. Why yeah. would I do that nonsense? Oh my god. Okay. Um, all right, so Club Gym Nerd member Anthony. Um, I'm gonna keep your last name private, but Anthony. Um, so Club Gym Nerd members like Anthony help us pay our bills, they sustain our work here at Gymcastic, they keep the lights on, um, they get discounts on our merch and live show tickets. And we have something special planned for 2024 for live shows, specifically for our members. And um you get a whole extra Q&A podcast. You can ask us anything every Friday at noon Pacific live, or you can send your questions in ahead of time just for Club Gym Nerd members, just for you every week. You can't get enough of us. You want to ask Spencer about his love life? We will put that in the questions. Will <laughs> nice we answer try. it? No. Okay. All right. So this, um, this mini commission is on Victoria Listanova. Anthony says, talk about her achievements through the years from junior world champion to the Olympics to now. So let us, let us begin with Listy, as she's known. Her very beginning in the Russian Espoir debut. Yeah, she was among the Russians who was a star from the very beginning. In terms of, like, she was the first first meet I was aware of, even aware of her, was like Russian Espoir, which is most countries call their pre-junior elite level Espoir. It's like the U.S. equivalent would be Hopes, probably. Um, but she was champion at 13, where she also outscored all the junior elites and all the senior elites except Melnikova. And it was kind of like, oh, so here's one. And then the next year in 2019 was sort of her international breakout when she won the all around at the junior world championships. And I think kind of at the time, but especially in retrospect, that competition, that 2019 junior worlds has been such a meat of foreshadowing because we had the, you know, the U S team was selected under controversial circumstances where Connor McLean, the best junior wasn't selected because she didn't finish high enough in the all around at the selection competition. And then the U S came in and they got decimated by Russia and an amazing performance by the Russian team where at least Dunova won the all around and they were just outright better than the U S team, especially in terms of artistry and performance and understanding what the code was looking for. Um, and that would be proven again at 
the Olympics. And it, I feel like that competition is if you wanted one meet that told you what was going to happen at the ultimately happen at the Tokyo Olympics, it was Listunova's breakout competition, Junior World Championships in 2019. And what was shown there that ended up being, you know, very consistent throughout was what a high hit percentage Listunova has had, especially in all around competitions and for the team. Not as much in event finals, like at the end of meets, but she's had been able to like put it together right away, which has set her apart from, you know, there are always extremely talented young Russian juniors and we expect them to kind of go to competitions and have some struggles. Maybe there's a beam meltdown rotation in here. And we saw that with Melnikova, I think like it took her time to kind of become a comfortable competitor and learn how to hit under pressure. Those first years, those first worlds where we saw her, she wasn't a super comfortable uh, all-arounder hitting a lot, and she kind of learned, we saw that progress in the all-around series of kind of becoming the best competitor she could be, whereas with Listunova, I feel like it was there much earlier. It was like, yeah, I'm going to go out and I'm going to hit. And that was another thing that we learned right from that early period. And much like Connor McLean. She was on a TV show, a talent show, um, much later than Connor, because Connor was on when she was like five or something. But um, Listy was on a talent show, Bluebird or something, um, early on, like in middle school age, in a unitard. It was a special, <laughs> special day. Pink unitard. Uh, I'm waiting for Germany to bust out mm. the hot pink um it's Leo coming, when sure. they go back to their neon 80s era um and you know if you're like who is this person what are you talking about just a reminder Listinova um was part of the gold medal winning team from Russia or the the IOS Olympic Federation of Russia in at the Tokyo Olympics so that's what we're talking about the next question is even though from our commissioner, Anthony, even though she ended up two per country out of the all around and bars final in Tokyo, do you think she was the best Russian gymnast at the time? Mm. This is a challenging question. I think she's the best Russian gymnast right now. In terms, maybe in terms of ceiling and in terms of potential that we saw at the Olympics. But I don't know that she was at that point all the way there yet compared to Melnikova, who was kind of at her peak. Like that was 2021. The Olympics Worlds was the best of her that we've seen. I don't think the Olympics was the best of Lisa Nova. Like I think she's improved since then. So maybe not. I would say, yeah, I think my answer is no. What's your answer? It's interesting because she was injured, right? She had an elbow injury around that time. She was the uh, European champion. And then, and then she took, she didn't go to the 2021 worlds, right? Where Melnikova Mm -hmm. became the all around champion. Um, So I don't know if she wasn't the best because of injury or she wasn't the best because she wasn't the best yet, but Melnikova was on and hitting and at her very best. So I've always expected Listy to do better on bars because she is such a bars ninja. Like she has every in bar or stalter skill. She can do them all with relatively good form. Um, Relatively. I disagree that she hasn't had like accomplishment. (laughs) Like she hasn't been, she she gets huge scores on bars. She gets huge scores on bars, but I'm, I'm expecting her to be like on the, on the podium in a big final. I mean, she's been not eligible for most of her senior career at this point. Yeah. So I think that's part of it. Um, My question, question. should, do you think she should have, so she didn't make the all-around final. Listunova did not. It was Melnikova and Arazova. Do you think Listunova should have been in over Arazova? Because I thought that was very controversial at the time. Being there, I thought... This was probably like Yorazova just had it by a tiny bit, Mm -hmm. but I was also surprised. I thought it was for sure going to go to Listanova, but being there and watching, I'm like, all right, there was a little advantage. Mm. Next Next question. question. 
I shall. Okay, where do you think she would have ended up if she competed all around bars and beam finals at the Olympics? See, this is where I was expect her to be. Yeah. So, okay, we'll start with all around. I mean, her scoring potential was as high as Olympic all around gold. Like, if you put her team final scores into the all around final, she could have beat Suni. Her performance on the day was up. Like, if she did her very best routine on all four events, she definitely could have won Olympic gold. I think it's, you know, that's it's asking a lot to do like your best routine on every event in the Olympic all around final. I think it's possible. It's also super realistic that she would have ended up like you're right where Orozova was in fourth. But the range is kind of there, you know. What routines do you bring on the day? What happens? But yeah, with a hit, she's right in there. She just was slightly shy of both of Melnikova and Arazova in qualification. So you could have seen that, you know, exact same thing happen again. Uh, what What about Beam? On Guan Beam, Chen-Chen. I mean, she was not beating Guan Chen Chen. No, no, no one was no beating Guan Chen Chen. No one was beating Guan Chen Chen. I think every, any other position was possible. Beam, I think, is the one that I has improved the most since the Olympics. It wasn't super smooth at the Olympics. It still had some kind of like Bambi was just born qualities. And then like later as she's progressed, it's gotten smoother. So maybe, I don't know, her team final score I thought was surprisingly high at the Olympics. And I think that she was in there. Could she have like, so Simone got bronze in the Beam final with, you know, not like, this is the gymnastics I'm able to do. I'm able to come back and compete. I'm able to do something. Wasn't everything Simone could do. Could Lisa Nova have beat that score? Yeah. Yeah. As for bars, I mean, that bars final was such a mess. <laughs> yeah, she could have medals. <laughs> Probably, you know, silver medal favorite with a hit. But yeah, I mean, in theory, she shouldn't have been able to medal in that bars final. But the way it played out, like... Pfft, Lots of people could have medaled in that final. This is Nina winning. Suni was Suni silver or bronze? Suni was bronze. When when Nita said that was like the worst routine you've ever done, and you still <laughs> medal, which is <was> so <laughs> Dutch Belgian I mean, for accurate. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. Okay, next question from Anthony. Can you also talk about her? How she competes? To, she compares to the rest of the world. Where she would have ended up in all around finals with her current scoring at Worlds this year? Well, she's been getting the big scores in Russia because she's so she's still competing at you know Russian Championships, Russian Cup. She's been getting the huge scores. You know, she has a fifty eight in the all around this year. In real life, she, she doesn't beat Simone's all around performance at Worlds, but she could be realistically in there to outscore Andrade, maybe close and definitely would be with a hit for event hit would be a favorite for a medal right now yeah. in yeah, an international all around final i think yeah at home she's getting you know in the 50 high 58s all around um she's yeah, getting 15s everywhere which is like settle down a little yeah. settle down but they're great routines that would score very well right 14s yeah 14 8 She's yeah. ranked, I mean, you know, number two on, uh, and this is according to the gym internet, which has all the score rankings, which we all depend on, which Lauren does a such, such a great job on, which is also always linked in our show notes. Um, yeah. Ranked second on floor with a 15 run at, at one at Russian championships. And generally we see the scores go down. Yeah. Um, Definitely. Yeah. I think like f- she would be a favorite for a floor medal borderline possible bars and beam medals, but you know, Bars is a deep event. Like, I don't necessarily think she's beating um, Chi or Chu, sorry, um, or Killian Amore. Yeah. But up there, Beam is Beam. Yeah. Beam is Beam. It's all fun and games until Russia goes to Beam. There's a shirt that says that. Okay. Uh, going, next question. Going off that, if Russia's allowed to, and she somehow qualifies to the Olympics, where would she fit into the Olympic picture for Paris? So, I mean, if she were somehow allowed, she would be, you know, the number one favorite as an individual in 2024 to qualify to Paris. And then I think her position in the hierarchy would be, as we just talked about, um, for the standings at Worlds last year and the possibilities. But as we talked about earlier in the episode, 
she's not going to be eligible. She shouldn't be eligible based on the rules that the FIG just published about, you know, appearing in pro Russian in uh, rallies and demonstrations. So I think it's not going to be a possibility, but if she were, yeah, she would be right up there. Lastly, if Russia wasn't banned, who do you think their team would include? Who would you put on the potential team as of now? I feel like they have a lot of talent. Okay, Melnikova and Listy are on it. Yeah. Yeah, period. After and- that, it is ooh, whoever. It would be have been like whoever Valentina hadn't canceled herself, like whoever she hadn't retired, because it is challenging. Orozova has not competed that much this year, but I think if healthy, you'd still want her on the team. And then they'd probably go with some of the very new seniors who have not been senior eligible in years when Russia has been able to compete like Akustova who's very good on bars. Yep. Um Litvieva was second all around I think at Russian Cup. There are a couple others in there, but yeah, I have no idea. Uh Asokina, she is eligible, right? Um, turn senior next year. Yeah. So she's okay. Paris. So eligible. I think she's in the 55s, you know, 55, 56 all around range um, based on, you know, the Russian um, home scoring, which, you know, might go down a little bit, but those I think are the ones, but, but also we anticipate all of them being ineligible. Right, and no. Russia can't qualify a team already. So. Yeah, as we as we discussed, as, as a the literal rule created so they can't. <laughs> as a thought experiment. Yeah. Uh, all right. Do you have any final thoughts this week? Anything you want to get off your chest, Spencer? Thankfully, we already got to talk about the U.S. selection committee minutes, so I feel like I got my thoughts off my chest about things. Um, I love that every time I see these committee minutes, I'm like, this is the most detailed we've ever gotten. And I feel like it's because I'm so scarred from the years of Marta just looking at you and being like, because bars. Next question. And I don't mean yeah. you. I mean, when we'd ask her questions. Yeah. This is, I mean, it's definitely detailed, more detailed, but not detailed enough. I know. We want just the discussion recordings. That's what we want. We I, want yeah, a live I, camp. Let me know why. Like, why is the highest scoring team not what you're interested in? Yeah. What's the thought process there? They do mention in those minutes that, you know, Leanne Wong is on, it's the best fourth score on like most teams because of qualification. So if that's a reasoning, I'd like them to spell them out, them to spell that out a little more. Like we care more about qualification than the team final. So then we could be like, why? <laughs> that's not where the medal is. Speaking of that, is it a good idea to ask the team who they want Ask the team what they think lineup should be. So it's not just the committee now that decides. So once you get to <laughs> a yeah. you know championships, whatever, the team is allowed to say, each individual gymnast is allowed to say what they think the lineup should be and give input. Is it fair to do that without um, putting parameters on how to discuss things in a kind and thoughtful way that doesn't make your teammates feel like crap about themselves if... Uh, so you're they saying know if, no one says if, they I, if we're on a team together and I'm like, Jessica shouldn't be in the bars lineup, you guys. Yeah, I think there's maybe like a, you know, secret ballot way of doing this. Like keep it to yourself and don't discuss it amongst yourselves, but that's not going to But happen. I think the like, you want the athletes to feel like they are listened to and have an investment in the team. Yeah, they've been here for a long time. They they have a lot of this. experience. They have a lot of experience. They know what they're looking at. They know what routines there are. But also, then you have, as an athlete, you have biases that hopefully the selection committee wouldn't have. Maybe right. do because gymnastics is a small world. But you have like your friends or your training teammates and things like that that come up, and maybe you're like, I want all of my friends to be in the beam lineup, and it's like, okay, well maybe that's not the best lineup so that comes up too i think that you want to you know you want to strike a balance where the athletes are listened to and that their perspectives taken into account without but with the understanding that like 
that's not necessarily going to happen. Like it, being like having a voice is not the same thing as everything you say automatically happens. Yeah. It's like you are being listened to. And like, that's part of the like formulating the trust with the athletes is that they have to believe you when you say, I am listening to you. I am taking that into account, even if I didn't do what you wanted. Yeah. Uh, I do really like that the athletes have a say and input. I don't know if they have a say. They have input. Yeah. Yeah. Which I think is really important. Um, keep an eye out for our updated international power rankings mm. that are coming out this week. Because I finally did my homework. Even though Spencer Whoa. turned his in early as usual. So give yeah. us your thoughts on those. <laughs> um, please subscribe to our YouTube and podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. Um, I have a new podcast player. I'm so sad about Stitcher still. I'm not over it. Anyway, thank you guys so much for your support. Thank you to Anthony for his mini commission. If you guys want to do a mini commission, you go to gymcast.com, join the club tab. You can do a gr- contribute to a group um, commission podcast. You can commission your own mini uh, commission like this on any topic as long as it's tangentially gymnastics related um, you can even dedicate an episode and you can give these as gifts the holidays are coming up you know it makes a, g- a great gift here I got you a gymcastic membership so you get an extra whole podcast every week speaking of which until Friday on behind the scenes at noon pacific remember to take off on gay split on rights thanks for listening and we'll see you on Friday international experience.